Dear friends, colleagues, get back to your chair. It's 4.30, we should, we should start on time because we, I, I was just telling Tony that, that we're doing extremely well on timing, so let, let's, let's keep with that. Um, I'm Arnaud Mel from, uh, from the ECB and uh, NCPR, and we're going to, to, um, to have uh, another session, this time on the side effects of CBDCs. Uh, that's um, a very broad topic. Uh, we can't cover everything. So we're going to zoom in on two aspects. Uh, one is on financial stability, and the other uh, are the external financial spillovers of CBDCs. And we have two great papers um, with Tony Annert from the ECB and Alessandro Moro from Marca d'Italia, uh, which uh, are going to pre be presented um, today in that session. And we are going to start now with uh, Tony's paper, which in fact is actually uh, been produced by a quatuor of, uh, of uh, ECB economists. Uh, so let's see what the music is like. Come on, Tony. Okay, um, thanks everybody for coming back. Um, and thanks to the other co-organizers for including this paper <laughs> in the program. So it's uh, joint work with my uh, three colleagues from the research department, Peter, Agnese, uh, and Davide. And uh, it's uh, trying to understand a bit better the implications of CBDC uh, for uh, financial stability and kind of banking stability in, in particular. So let me, let me not uh, motivate CBDC for this audience. So we think about CBDC as, as digital cash in, in this paper. And in particular, for several years now, there's been uh, these concerns by, by various policymakers to study the financial stability implications of CBDC. And in particular, it was voiced, for example, in uh, some BIS documents, that uh, the existence of a CBDC could increase the risk of a bank run, especially in, in uh, kind of during crisis times or in, in terms of stress and uh, turmoil. And the reason why that might be is that a CBDC is a very safe store of value. So basically, as long as the Kind of political order of a of a country or, or currency area is, is still in place the central bank will honor uh, its obligations right so this is will be one of the last claims to be defaulted upon in the economy and apart from this inherent uh, safety as a, a safe store of value uh, the cbdc might uh, also be uh, remunerated adding to the potential incentive of an investor to withdraw from a troubled bank and redeposit uh, with the central bank. So in the policy debate, uh, several proposals have been put forward uh, to adjust the design of CBDC in order to mitigate that uh, bank run concern. So in particular, people think about how, whether and how CBDC should be remunerated. We've already today discussed uh, quite a bit uh, the issue of holding limits. And uh, we haven't uh, discussed it much today, but there's also this notion of contingent uh, remuneration. So making the remuneration of CBDC contingent on uh, the financial system, kind of how much stability or turmoil, turmoil there is in, in the system. So the objective of this paper is uh, to study the financial stability implications and to uh, address uh, these policy questions by deriving the consequences of various CBDC designs uh, in the context of a, a parsimonious model that helps us guide and understand these various proposals. I, uh, before I go uh, any, any further, I should say that these are our own views and uh, not necessarily the, the views of the ECB, and we are not part of the digital euro team, so these views need not be uh, the views of the digital euro team. So the, uh, the paper and the slide, uh, it's a parsimonious model of bank runs because the policy concern is really about runs on banks. 
use global games methods to derive a unique equilibrium. And the main positive result of the paper is that remunerating CBDC, uh, sorry, the, the, the main way of modeling CBDC is uh, that CBDC can be remunerated uh, in a kind of a narrow sense, this would be a pecuniary uh, remuneration, but in a broader sense, it could also be non-pecuniary benefits of CBDC. So it's a digital means of payments, so it can be uh, used for making purchases online, while cash cannot be used to buy things on Amazon, for example. So we want to think about, uh, or we could think about uh, this, this remuneration in a, in a slightly uh, broader sense. So the, the main positive uh, finding of the paper is uh, that uh, increasing the remuneration of CBDC has two opposing effects on bank fragility. So first, and in line with the policy debate for the last years, a higher CBDC increases the withdrawal incentives of depositors, and therefore bank fragility goes up. So that's very intuitive, right? You're worried about the bank, and now you can uh, withdraw from the bank and suddenly, instead of just putting it uh, under the mattress and getting 0% nominal interest rate by holding it in cash, you can now deposit it with the central bank and you might get 2%, 4%, right? So that on the margin makes you more likely to withdraw from the bank, especially if you're worried about the health of that bank. So that's a very robust uh, channel and in line with the policy debate. However, and that's kind of the, the contribution of this paper, there's a second channel. So, the, so CBDC will be a competition uh, for banks. So in order to retain funding, banks need to offer better deposit rates. So they, they, we look at the endogenous response of the, of the banking system and these uh, better deposit rates will make the bank more stable. So if the bank offers me a good rate, so uh, if I stay, so I'm more willing uh, to keep my funds uh, in the bank. So in the second uh, indirect effect will reduce bank fragility. So we have a, a force, uh, a trade-off between this direct and indirect effect, and we show that taking both of them into account, so if you want uh, kind of moving a bit uh, more towards kind of a general equilibrium uh, analysis by endogenizing deposit rates, taking both of these effects into uh, account, we get a, a U-shaped relationship between CBDC remuneration and bank fragility. So the immediate uh, uh, first policy implication is that if the relationship is U-shaped with a positive remuneration as uh, the point where bank stability is, is maximized and fragility minimized, well, then uh, we policymakers uh, who, who want to introduce CBDC should be remunerated. So this would be good for financial stability. <clears throat> then we use this parsimonious model to evaluate several policy proposals. The first one is uh, holding limits, and we show that holding limits have an ambiguous effect. So under some circumstances, they can be good, but in some circumstances, they can be bad as well. So it's, uh, the policy Im implication would be that we have to be a bit cautious. So it's, it's not uh, a panacea. Uh, so hoarding limits may have unintended consequences. And the, the third policy tool that we evaluate is contingent remuneration. So the idea is that in normal times, you, you get 4% on your CBDC. But uh, when there are withdrawals from the banking system, so when we are starting to enter a, a crisis period, then the central bank will lower the return on CBDC, say, to 1%. And uh, that tool turns out to be quite effective. And we show uh, that this can improve uh, financial stability. And in, in fact, one of the bottom lines uh, will be that contingent remuneration, at least in our model, uh, could be more effective than holding limits just to put the, the interesting uh, result uh, out there, by the way. Uh, so just placing it a little bit in the literature, so this idea that uh, CBDC uh, is uh, kind of bank, competes with bank deposits and gives depositor uh, an interesting outside option has already uh, been, been studied. 
in, in various papers, including uh, by uh, by my discussant and in, in, uh, Janet's paper in, in, the, in the JPE. Um, but most of that uh, existing literature looks at how this increased competition affects credit supply, so how it affects the bank lending decisions. In contrast, our focus is on financial stability. So there's been uh, some work uh, about the financial stability implications of CBDC already, usually in the context of a diamond dipping model. Our contribution is to use uh, global games methods, um, pioneered by Carlson and Van Damme, and then uh, popularized by Morse and Chin, uh, among others. And the benefit of this approach is that it allows us to give us a unique equilibrium so we can precisely state how changes in the bank deposit rates affect uh, financial stability, and we can precisely calculate how changes in uh, CBDC design uh, affects financial stability. So that's the, the way we think we can, con we hope to contribute to the literature. So the model will have three parts. It looks at the withdrawal behavior of bank deposits and the global games approach gives us an endogenous probability of a bank one, which will be our measure of financial stability or financial fragility, as it's uh, often called in this particular literature. We then, so this will be at the withdrawal subgame. We then move uh, to the funding stage where banks try to attract funding um, by offering deposit rates when they compete with remunerated CBDC. And we look at the response of banks to the existence of CBDC. Um, well, when we say the response of banks are really the only, the only dimension we consider in this paper is the deposit rate. And then finally, we, we turn uh, to the design stage where a social planner considers uh, various design features, voting limits, contingent remuneration, um, regular remuneration, and so on. And we see how that affects uh, welfare and financial stability. So we're going to use a standard global games models of bank runs, so very much in the spirit of the seminal Goldstein and Pausner Journal of Finance 2005 paper. And the, the model, the particular model we're using is uh, based uh, on a paper by uh, Elena Carletti, Agnese Leonello, who's a co-author on, on, on this paper, and, and Robert Marquez in a paper they published this year in, in the JFE. So we, it's a real model, it's one good, three dates, uh, everybody's risk neutral. There's a single commercial bank and a continuum of investors with endowment. The bank has access to a profitable investment project. So it offers uh, a demand deposit contract to depositors to get their funding. The fact that uh, deposits are demandable is not microfounded. We take it as given. There are many famous theories out there why that might be the case. Also empirically, uh, a lot of funding, both in Europe and in the US, is demand deposits or kind of has a similar structure. So we take that as a given here. So the project uh, is costly to liquidate and uh, yields a return R times theta in the final date. I guess I, I have to stay here. So theta, uh, theta is a random variable that uh, captures the fundamentals of the economy and R is just a parameter that uh, captures the profitability of lending or of financial intermediation more broadly. And then we have this deposit contract where kind of a standard diamond dipwick type deposit contract where you get a low deposit rate if you stay with the bank for one period, but you get a high deposit rate if you stay with the bank for two periods. And then we have this exogenous law bound on, uh, on the deposit rate to capture uh, the, the fact that, um, that these are demand deposits. At the initial date, at the, at the funding stage, the investor decides whether to keep their funds in cash, yielding uh, a return normalized to a zero, or hold bank deposits. And now with CBDC, there's this uh, outside option 
of depositing with the central bank as well. So there are many, there are many features CBDCs might have. So we zoom in on one feature, which is its remuneration. So CBDC can offer a positive remuneration. And in the narrow sense, this would be the pecuniary uh, remuneration that we have already discussed today, but there could also be non-pecuniary benefits uh, associated with it. As it's standard in, in these bank run models, at the interim date, um, so all of us are depositors, we will all have deposited with the, the one bank, say the, the Arno bank, we've all deposited with the Arno bank, and uh, in, in most states of the world, the Arno bank is, is very healthy, has a high realization of FITA, unfortunately, they are, yeah, okay. <laughs> Probably my time allocation is moving down to two minutes uh, very shortly. Yeah? So, but unfortunately, in some states of the world, the Arnaud Bank has a low realization of, of the fundamentals, so maybe it's better to get our money out and uh, withdraw while we can. So each of us, and that's the global games approach, each of us gets um, a private signal about the, the health of the bank, so that's the signal SI, conditionally independent fundamental plus noise. And then based on the signal, each of us decides whether or not to withdraw from uh, the Arnaud Bank. Let N be the number of, of withdrawals at the interim date. So there will be a cutoff. If enough of us withdraw, then uh, the Arnaud Bank will be insolvent at the final date. You know, the, the withdrawals lead to costly liquidation of investment that will uh, eventually uh, lead to insolvency. Even worse, if more of us, if almost all of us withdraw, then uh, Arnaud is, is liquidating the project, but it will not be enough. If enough of uh, us withdraw, then uh, uh, the bank will be illiquid and cannot even meet uh, the uh, redemptions at the, uh, at the interim date. So that's the model. It might seem uh, innocent, uh, but given that we kind of have uh, analysis at three dates, right? Date one, date zero, and then if you want date minus one, when we think about policy design, it's it's not that innocent. So we uh, we would like, actually we need to, we think we need to make simplifying assumptions. The first one is vanishing private noise. So the epsilon term uh, is, is kind of the, the noise associated with that term is going to zero. And then there will be bankruptcy costs. So whenever the bank fails, very little is recovered, so we actually assume nothing is recovered. So the idea is you all pay it to, to lawyers and uh, you know, the process of bankruptcy is, is usually very costly. So empirically in the US, uh, the evidence is that about 30% of asset value is destroyed in bankruptcy. Okay, and um, that's a simple two-period model. So we work backwards. We start with the withdrawal behavior at uh, date one, at the interim date. Then we go to the funding stage and determine bank deposits, bank deposit rates. And then we consider the impact of CBDC remuneration and then eventually the other design options as well. So this is just uh, the, the equilibrium for different realizations of FITA. So if, uh, uh, if the Arnaud Bank has made amazing investments, we are above uh, FITA upper bar, and even if everybody withdraws, uh, there, will be, there will be enough funds uh, for all of us. Um, also, there's a lower dominance regions when the investments turn out to be bad, then even if nobody withdraws, uh, th there will be in insolvency. And in the interim, uh, and in the intermediate region, I mean, this is a version of Diamond Dipwick, if you want, you have multiple equilibria where both survival and failure of the bank is possible. So it's kind of a 1980s, 90s coordination game. What the global games gives us is it removes the multiplicity in this intermediate region to a single point. So in equilibrium, there will be a new, unique theta star such that the bank fails if and only if the realized fundamental is below theta star. And I'm going to spare you the math, but just to get the intuition of how we determine uh, theta star from the final equation on the slide. So these are the incentives of the marginal depositor. Remember, each of us deposited with unknown, and each of us get a private signal. 
for those of you who got a very favorable signal, you decide not to withdraw. For some of you who got an unfavorable signal, you choose uh, to withdraw. And there will be one person in the room who just got the marginal signal, kind of the threshold signal. This person is exactly indifferent between withdrawing and not withdrawing. So this person uh, considers if I, if I stay, I get the high return R2 at the final date. But I'm not always getting it. I'm only getting it when the bank survives, which happens when less than n had people uh, withdraw. That was the insolvency threshold. If I withdraw, I get a low deposit return R1, but I get it more often. Uh, I get it whenever the bank is liquid at the interim date. So that's, that's the fundamental trade-off. And that we would already have in, in the earlier bank run uh, work. What we are adding here are the omegas. That's the CBDC or CBDC remuneration more precisely. So we see the direct effect in blue. If I withdraw from the bank at date one and then I redeposit with the central bank, I get the cross remuneration omega for one period. So there's a blue omega. This is the direct effect. This will make me withdraw more often. Makes the, uh, the expected payoff from withdrawing will go up. However, and that's you know what the policymakers have focused on uh, in, in most of the debate. What the paper contributes is the wet effect, the indirect effect. So banks will respond to the existence of CBDC and adjust deposit rates. So the deposit rates are will adjust. So, so then we just uh, solve for the unique failure threshold. We show that indeed the direct effect is that higher remuneration makes the bank more fragile. We then also show that in the relevant part of the equilibrium, higher deposit rates will make the bank more stable. And to study the total effect of uh, CBC remuneration on, uh, on fragility, we need to combine the direct and the indirect effect, right? So that is, we need to pin down deposit rates. So banks maximize expected profits subject to the participation constraint of depositors. And if I go to the bank, I get R2 whenever the bank survives. But if I go to the central bank and deposit in CBDC, I get CBDC remuneration, but now I get it for two periods. I get it between uh, date zero and day two. So that's how CBDC remuneration affects the participation constraint of depositors and thus the deposit rates offered by the bank. We make some parameter assumptions and the key result here is that the higher CBDC remuneration increases the long-term deposit rate. Remember, the long-term deposit rate was what, uh, in the relevant part of the, uh, was the one that makes the bank more stable. If the bank offers me a more attractive long-term rate, then I'm more willing to stay with the bank. So we put the direct and the indirect effect together, and we get the main result, the main positive result of the paper, the U-shape. So we see financial fragility, theta star, as a func function of CBDC remuneration, taking all effects into account. So and here we see uh, that financial fragility is minimized at an uh, interior level of remuneration. So that suggests that uh, a policy proposal to have zero remuneration on CBDC is undesirable from a financial stability perspective. So moving to the, to the normative part of the paper and the design of CBDC, we view the central bank as a constraint planner. So it takes this given the informational friction, so the dispersed private information, the signals that we all get, and the, private, the privately optimal deposit rate setting behavior of the bank. And it max, uh, in order to maximize utilitarian welfare. I mean, there's always the question is, what's your welfare uh, uh, criterion? But utilitarian welfare seems, the, seems kind of the least objectionable um, criterion. 
And in this simple model, it turns out that welfare is maximized. So welfare is just expected payoffs to everybody. Um, and welfare is maximized whenever fragility is minimized. So if the central bank can pick remuneration directly, it should pick the, the omega min, the remuneration that minimizes fragility. But if CBDC is widely uh, adopted, uh, maybe uh, CBDC remuneration will then be used, I mean, in 10 years from now, for monetary policy perspectives as well, because it will affect um, almost everybody in, in the economy. So it could be that uh, this remuneration is not available for financial stability perspectives, uh, for financial stability objectives. So instead, we can uh, think about holding limits. And the way we think about holding limits is uh, that the proportion of wealth can be put in CBDC and the rest has to be put in cash, which in our model is without loss of generality because in equilibrium, everybody is homo homogenous. So what we see basically, introducing a holding limit shifts out the U. It shifts out the U to the right. And depending on where you are, this is good or bad for financial stability. So that's the sense in which uh, the, the, uh, the effect of holding limits is ambiguous. It will also have redistributive effects. So we have several statements on redistribution in the paper. I won't have time today to talk about this. So finally, there's been a proposal uh, to consider contingent remuneration of CBDC, and in particular to pay a lower rate once there are withdrawals in the system. And in, this will be very effective. And the reason why this is very effective is that our indirect effect, which works via the participation constraint of depositors and uh, the bank deposit rates, is either is, is very little affected by by contingent remuneration. So details are in the paper, but basically this would be a very promising and perhaps a more promising uh, approach than holding limits. There are various extensions. And to wrap up, so we offered the parsimonious model of the financial stability implications of CBDC. CBDC is modeled as an improved outside option consistent with the literature. And we consider both the endogenous withdrawal incentives and endogenous um, deposit rates and evaluate the uh, efficacy of various CBDC design options. The main positive result is the U-shape, uh, where financial fragility first decreases and then increases in um, CBDC remuneration because of this trade-off between the direct and the indirect effect. And uh, we use the model to uh, evaluate uh, these various policy proposals. And I very much look forward uh, to the discussion by my former colleague, uh, Yusu. Thanks, Denis. So we have indeed um, live from, um, from China, from Renmin University, you two. Um, not exactly sure what, what time it is for you, you but it's, it's probably late in the night, no, if, I, if I get the, the time difference right. Um, in any case, it's great to have you here and to have your discussion. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Okay, that's great. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, for giving me, me the chance to discuss with this very interesting paper. Ideally, I, I hope I could be there person, uh, in person and hang out with uh, my old and new friends, but since the visa didn't work out that way, so I have to stay here. But um, yeah, this is a very interesting paper. I, I pretty much uh, enjoy reading it. Uh, I learned a lot. So does, does the slide move? The slide does move. Okay, great. So let me first summarize this paper. It looks at the following question. How does a CBDC affect financial stability measured by the probability of bank failures? I feel this is a very important question related to CBDC, but in my mind, it, it's understudied in the literature. There are a few papers, but 
I think there are still a lot of things we need to know. Uh, and the, this paper provides a new angle, basically using a diamond divic style model to think about the probability of bank failures that hasn't been discussed before. And the model has a bank with a monopoly power, and they use this global game uh, technique to, to get uh, bank failure probability. And the conclusion is the CBDC can increase financial stability. Of course, there are all other parts uh, of the paper, but I think that's a very important punchline. This is, this argument is similar to our previous paper. It's like a discipline argument, but we were looking at the, uh, the lending quantity, but here is looking at financial stability. And in this type of argument, bank market power is crucial. Okay. So, uh, it's a great paper, very elegant. I'm going to just uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some simplifications in the paper that makes the model very elegant and easy to solve. There is a question uh, whether that would have implications on the robustness of the conclusion. Okay. So, let me first reproduce the model setup. Uh, so, it's a three period model in time zero. The central bank says CBDC a rate or remuneration. And then bank use a deposit contract that specify two interest rate R1 and R2. That's the interest you would get in T equals one and T equals two to obtain project, uh, to obtain deposits and invest in risky project. Okay. Depositors then choose whether to hold CBDC or hold back deposits. And at T equals one, there is a fundamental shock uh, to the investment that's realized, and depositors all observe the private signal of the shock and decide whether to withdraw uh, or not. And then, if they withdraw, they would hold CBDC instead. And then, if there are people withdraw, the bank have to liquidate the investment to satisfy these withdrawals. And in T equals two. The investment matures and depositors uh, withdraws the remaining deposits and consume. And you can see all consumptions happen at T equals two. So there are few simplifications and deviations from Diamond Divic to make the model very tractable. And there is a question: uh, What's the implication? Are these uh, deviations? First, all consumers are assumed to be patient. They only consume and they earn. There is no early consumers as in diamond dynamic model, and they are all risk neutral. That means essentially there is no need to ensure liquidity. Okay. And an implication of that, I guess that is true, is that if there is no restriction, it's optimal for the bank to set R1 equals zero just to rule out any early risk withdrawals. But here there is an assumption R1 is at least one, uh just and at the end of the day, R1 in the equilibrium equals one. Okay. A third uh, simplification is that there is no recovery value. If the bank fails, everybody gets zero. Okay. Uh, this simplify depositors value. These are all nice for making the model tractable, but uh, uh, what are the implications of these deviations for the result? Which ones are crucial for the results? I don't know. I would like to see a, a more discussion on that. And of course, if there are us, uh, crucial deviations, there is a question, are these deviations realistic? Okay. Uh, also, this there is also another thing that's related to deposit insurance. In, for example, in Ski, David Ski's paper, that's, this, uh, that's cited in this paper. He basically says if you have a deposit insurance like policy, uh, there would be no wrong. I, I would, I'm interested to see if there is a deposit insurance here, uh, what's gonna happen, okay. Uh, second comment is more about uh, writing. I would like to see uh, more intuition of the main result. So the main result is this U-shaped relationship, but somehow it looks like it depends on this elasticity of the bank run cutoff with respect to this R2. Uh, and this 
this elasticity is first larger than one and then less than one, there is a question, is that, what, what's the intuition behind that? I didn't quite get it. Is that due to uh, parametric consumption or is that robust? I would like to know more about that. That's a second comment. And there are a few other comments, but mostly about writing. Uh, for example, I think the model description can be improved. There are certain parts was a clear from the text. For example, the depositors preference is not clear from the text whether there are early deposit uh, depositors who want to consume early or not. That wasn't clear. I get that from uh, there is a timeline table, but it's not clear in the text. And there are other assumptions. For example, there is another one that says that the liquidation value equals the, uh, the R, that's uh, the return of the asset in at the end, if it matures, if theta is high enough, that's a fundamental. So that assumption, I think, needs a little bit more explanation. Uh, and I also want to see more intuition that relating different model assumptions to the result. Uh, one thing is what I have already um, mentioned that R equals one is that because of uh, there is no liquidity insurance need or not. Uh, and uh, last thing is like, uh, how can we endogenize the market power in this setup? There is an extension where there is a bargaining uh, between the bank and the depositors basically to, to, to give the depositors a little bit bargaining power, but is there a way to endogenize that bargaining power? Uh, that's another open question. And to conclude, I find this is a very interesting paper addressing an important question. It brings new approach to the literature. I think that's very valuable. We can talk about probabilities of bank failures. And I think uh, it's good if the authors could clarify the effects of the simplifying assumptions. And uh, of course, I look forward to raise the next version of the paper. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for the discussion, which is not only um, excellent on content, but it's also perfect in terms of timing because we're even ahead of, uh, of, of schedule. So that's great. So, so to, do, you want, do you want to say something already on, 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 on the discussion or, or we can move with, uh, with uh, questions? I, think, I mean, uh, I would, Okay, so so we so we have even more time for the for the for the Q and A then. Uh, so here are some questions. So Timothy, I think you, you have a question. Do I see you right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't think. Hi. Um. How should I think about the net worth channel in this case? Because normally, if you think of an introduction of CBDC, more competition for the bank, that would mean reduced profits for the bank in this case because of higher uh, deposit rates, reduced profits, lower net worth, more likely to fail, rather than the opposite, which you're saying. So. I see one on my right, which should be your left, Alexandre. Um, yeah, uh, have you looked at the, the case where um, R2 equals R1 squared, which which would be kind of mirroring this omega squared kind of uh, return rate? And Derek has, yep, there we go. Um, I, I have problems thinking about this run out of deposits when I don't know what the central bank is going to do with those funds. So so how should I think about the asset side of the central bank? So I. How, what is this omega in that context? If, the, if there's a run and people move out of deposits into CBDC, the central bank presumably invests those funds somewhere, wouldn't that not mean that also this omega is sort of low or maybe high if they buy this stuff in a crisis, something like this? And more generally, if the omega is a parameter, what I didn't get is why from a normative point of view, you wouldn't set this omega as high as possible move everything into CBDC and make welfare unboundedly high. This I didn't get. So I have Malte. Catherine now also has a question. Yeah, so I was wondering whether your simulations um, have some quantitative implications. So there's 105 means that is 5% remuneration of CBDC is optimal. And could you think about having some quantitative uh, interpretation, maybe by looking at theta as the probability to fail or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Tony is very successful. There is there is a question on the fourth row in the middle. That's right. Yeah. 
Okay, maybe it's more a comment than a question, but I think it, it is time to do it also, because it is for all the papers that we have been seeing today. So I have the feeling like it, those papers are not about CBDC, but they are about some imperfection in the deposit market or some fail of competition. And they feel like all the paper has these interest rates on deposit and competition with deposits as the solution for some something that is not working properly, that could be financial stability or the transmission of monetary policy. But so if at the end what we listened at the at the beginning of today that the CBDC will not be remunerated. So what I what I have to to take from all these papers and in particular for this one of competition in, in deposits to to increase the let's say financial stability. It's a very deep question. Um, Massimo, do I get it right that there's no questions in the chat? Okay. Okay, then I don't see and I no. It's a bit like in, a, in an auction, no? It's people move. <laughs> okay, so I misinterpreted some of the body movements. So, Tony, go ahead. Okay, uh, awesome. These are great comments. Thank you so much. Let me try to answer uh, at least uh, some of them. So, first of all, you thank you for the excellent discussion. Uh, please send me the slides. We'll definitely uh, work on uh, these kind of clarifications. I think we can do we can do more. Um, in terms of the relevance of the various assumptions. Um, so I agree that market power is, is key, and um, I didn't have time to talk about it in the presentation, but once there's a high degree of competition, um, the U-shape breaks down. I mean, in particular, under perfect competition, we can even show analytically that it, it no longer is there, right? So the sufficient amount of market power in the deposit market is a critical ingredient for our result. Let me use this to answer or to uh, respond to the very last comment. Uh, hopefully it's a bit clearer in the paper, but uh, the, the friction, the fundamental friction is imperfect competition in the deposit market, right? And that, uh, I agree that uh, we also have a survey paper where we discussed this a bit, there could be direct regulation addressing that, but in the absence of, of such regulation, CBDC is, one indirect measure of, of trying to get at that friction. <clears throat> the second uh, point you uh, that you made about the role of the assumptions is that indeed um, we have um, we kind of have liquidity preference in a, implicitly in a way that consumers value the ability to withdraw. But once they withdraw and they get one, they're happy. And then, you know, uh, beyond that, there is no liquidity insurance motive. So we received that comment uh, at a conference uh, last week uh, from a discussant as well. And we are currently working on, on another extension. So we, it looks like we can actually do that. So we, we do a more like traditional diamond dipping style, risk averse depositors. Uh, so they, they value a higher short term rate. And then on top of everything I've shown you today, we can then also uh, study how a change in CBDC innovation affects the short-term deposit rate, which then indirectly again will affect uh, financial stability. So that's, I think we have a setup of, of working this out. We don't have results yet, but it, in the new version, there will be a result on this. So hopefully that will address that comment. Thirdly, you discuss bankruptcy costs. Uh, the honest answer is we tried without this assumption and we couldn't uh, get to results <laughs> uh, more than a year ago. So that's why it was a simplifying assumption. But I have a paper on asset encumbrance in the RFS uh, published several years ago. And there we had studied both uh, the model with and without bankruptcy cost. And it turned out that the economic channels were the same. It's just uh, without bankruptcy cost, there's much more math because there are more terms to play around with, but it didn't, that didn't affect the results. Um, here, we even uh, make the stronger assumption that the bankruptcy costs even at, at, the, um, at the interim date, 
but uh, we have a new project with uh, so I'm, um, my long-term co-author Christoph Bert and Jesse Leonello, who's on, on this paper, and Robert Marquez from Davis, where we look at uh, Silicon Valley Bank and you know failures in West uh, Coast banks uh, this year in the U.S. and trying to study that in, in the context of uh, a global games bank run model and how there were kind of failures in bank risk management. And there we, we can show that if we don't make this bankruptcy cost assumption at date one, uh, the results uh, go through. So that gives me, gives me comfort that uh, the results aren't sensitive to the bankruptcy cost assumption. Um, so this liquidation value improving is kind of a standard global games assumption. Uh, the global games people know that it's ugly, but it has to be assumed. Uh, the rest of the profession uh, tends to be less forgiving. Uh, so we... We maybe just put in the appendix. Let me um, let me just say something about deposit insurance. Uh, so implicitly, I mean, this, these are uninsured deposits, right? So the, the short answer could be that some deposits are insured and some are uninsured, and then the fragility comes from the uninsured part. Um, to the extent that these are not just idiosyncratic failures, but there's this kind of systemic banking uh, crises involved. So these are kind of macro shocks consistent with the theme of the conference, uh, then it's likely that the deposit insurance funds, which in most jurisdictions are actually very poorly capitalized, will not be able to cover all deposits. So even with deposit insurance, there is this issue of uh, deposit insurance being not particularly credible once you look at, at its funding. Yeah? So in that sense, our focus is on uninsured deposits. Uh, and I think we looked, uh, we, we cite an AR paper that looks at US data in the 2010s and they find that uh, roughly half of the deposits are uninsured. Um, I'll get back to some of the, the comments uh, bilaterally. Uh, let me just uh, respond to Katrin that we say we only have numerical examples. So this is a two period model. We didn't. To, I mean, I think we cannot do easily a, a serious uh, calibration that would be would be stretching the model. So I think we should be humble and just say that we cannot do it. Um, the final point to Timothy Timothy about the net worth channel. So it is it is a static model, and you know there are dynamic uh, banking models. You know, Keeley AR 1990, for example, that emphasize the network channel. We do, however, so we, we cannot fully address this, this point. We do, however, have an extension with risk taking on the asset side. And that gets at, at this, uh, this flavor. So the bank chooses uh, how much risk management to do. And then the uh, CBC remuneration will affect the deposit rates, will affect the skin in the game. And the skin in the game will affect the extent of the risk taking on the asset side. So we, we have a little bit of this on the extension, but uh, for the most part, we're dodging, we're dodging this, but we have a little bit. Uh, we 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 show that we can still get our result. Yeah. Thank you so much for the comments, and I'll, I'll try to respond to the remaining ones in, in the next break. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay. <laughs> Second paper. So after the ECB quartet, we have the Banca d'Italia duo duet. <laughs> Alessandro, please. So, good evening. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the organizing committee. It's really a great pleasure to be here to present this paper entitled The External Financial Spillovers of CBDC written together with Valerio Nispilandi, a colleague of mine at the Bank of Italy. And the usual disclaimer applies. So many central banks around the world are working on CBDC projects. Some small economies have already issued their own CBDC, such as the Bahamas, the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, the Nigeria. Regarding the major economies, uh, the digital renminbi is uh, already in a pilot stage, while the ECB has started the preparation phase for the digital euro. The Fed is also studying a CBC project, a digital dollar. Um, 
as we have learned also from previous presentation, uh, the issuance of uh, CBDC might have important uh, consequences on the issuing countries, but uh, it might also generate important international spillovers, in particular on emerging market economies, which uh, might experience an increase in remittances if CBDC uh, makes transaction costs lower, they might lose monetary policy independence in the presence of currency substitution, or they might face a banking disintermediation. In uh, this paper, we focus on this third issue, and we analyze the macro financial uh, implications for, emer for an emerging market economies of a CBDC issue by a foreign systemic economy. And to do that, we set up a DSGE model uh, for an emerging market economy that features uh, um, the original scene. So basically, uh, the external debt of the emerging market economies is denominated in foreign currencies. There is a banking sector, sector a la Gertler Karadi. And then there are uh, three monetary assets, uh, cash, domestic cash, domestic deposits, and the foreign CBDC that yield uh, liquidity services, but entail a cost in terms of, of anonymity or security loss. So the foreign CBDC can be more similar to cash or to deposits. So under these alternative CBDC designs, we simulate the transition to a new steady state characterized by a stronger preference toward the foreign CBDC. We will see uh, which policy instrument can be used to address the negative effects of, of this transition. And then we'll also analyze how different levels of investment in the foreign CBDC uh, affect the transmission mechanism of a standard shock, a shock on the foreign interest rate. So regarding the results, uh, we show that the implication of the foreign CBDC for, the, for an emerging market really depend uh, on the design of the CBDC. If the CBDC is close to cash, is designed to be similar to cash, household, domestic household substitute domestic cash with the foreign deposits, uh, so, sorry, domestic cash with the foreign CBDC with limited uh, macro financial implications. While if the CBDC is designed to be more similar to deposit, uh, domestic household substitute uh, domestic deposit with the foreign CBDC, and this leads to a credit crunch in the small open economy and a strong reduction in output. And we, we will show that uh, there are some useful policy that can address the negative effects of, of the preference shocks, in particular macroprudential policy, capital control on outflows, which in our framework are a capital control on uh, foreign CBDC holdings, FX interventions can help to smooth the, the transition, while capital controls on inflows are far less effective. Moreover, targeting PPI inflation is better than targeting CPI inflation or exchange rate pegging in, in dealing with uh, such shocks. And finally, if the remuneration of the CBDC is constant, a higher level uh, of, of investment in a foreign CBDC can shield the economy uh, from an increase in the foreign interest rate. So our paper is related to the uh, literature trying to uh, address the macroeconomic consequences of CBDC. Many paper are, uh, are papers about closed form econo closed economy models. Um, most of them find that uh, a CBDC competing with a monopolistic banking system uh, can be well for improving. Some other finds. Uh, that uh, um, CBDC could be detrimental for welfare depending on their design. So, for example, Agur et al. Uh, find that if the CBDC is close to deposit, it, it might lead to banking disintermediation, while if it is 
too close to cash, it uh, may generate the disappearance of these means of payment. And if households have a, a preference for a variety of means of payment, this could be detrimental for welfare. Uh, focusing on the problem of banking disintermediation, Brunner, Meyer, and Nippel find an equivalence result if uh, uh, deposit and CBDC are perfect substitute, because in this case, uh, the loss of deposit in the banking system can be compensated through central bank injections without altering the equilibrium of the model. And uh, um, Burlon et al. and Asen Marker et al. find that the, the risk of banking disintermediation can be mi minimized uh, by choosing properly the remuneration of CBDC or imposing quantity restrictions. Regarding the literature on, economy, on uh, open economy models with a CBDC, the literature has focused on the problem of currency substitution, in particular Ikeda, uh, Ferrari Minesso, uh, Mel and, uh, and Stracca also showed that CBDC may increase international linkages, so amplifying foreign shocks. Uh, some colleagues at the Bank of, uh, at the Bank of Italy, Cova, uh, Notar Pietro, Pagano and Pisani, find that uh, an economy issuing its own central bank, central bank digital currency can help can restore its monetary policy independence in the presence of global privately issued stable coins. And finally, there is this uh, paper uh, written by Popescu in which using uh, a, a bank runs model, it, it shows that um, a foreign CBDC could increase the risk of bank disintermediation in emerging market economies. So our paper is closer to this Popescu, the last one, but we addressed this issue considering a general -like equilibrium model. So this slide shows uh, the basic archi arch architecture of our DSG. The uh, white blocks uh, represent domestic agents, so agents resident in the, in the small open economy, while the yellow rectangulars are foreign agents. So we have households uh, that uh, can invest in three types of assets, of liquid assets, cash issued by uh, uh, a local uh, central bank, the foreign CBDC issued by the foreign central bank, and domestic deposits issued by the domestic uh, banking sectors. Households also provide labor to domestic firms, and they can also purchase bond is issued by the local government. Banks collect deposit from both household, domestic household and foreign households, and they use these loans and they use this domestic this deposit to provide loans to domestic firms. Domestic firms use these, these loans to buy capital from capital producers. Uh, domestic firm produce a, a good that is sold both to domestic household and it is also exported to the rest of the world. So now we enter into the um, more original uh, aspect of our model, starting uh, from domestic households. Uh, domestic households derive utility from consumption and disutility from labor, as it is standard. But then we assume that they also uh, derive utility from holding liquid assets, this LT, and, but this liquid asset entail a cost in terms of security or anonymity loss. In the next slide, I will describe in detail these three new features. And the maximization of, of household utility is subject to a budget constraint in which on the right hand side you find the labor income plus profit minus taxation plus the return on previous period position on bond, domestic bond, domestic deposit, uh, cash holdings, uh, the value of the, the uh, position on the foreign CBDC, uh, which has and since this is a, a, an asset, a foreign asset denominated in foreign unit of account, its value is adjusted by S, which is the real exchange rate. And then we have also uh, a tax, a tax on outflows. Uh, and it is important to see that here we specify a return for, for, uh, for the um, CBDC. But in most model simulation, we set the, the remuneration of, of CBDC to zero. 
And on the left hand side, you have how you can spend your income. So consumption, new position on, on domestic bond, on domestic deposit, cash and the foreign CBDC. Doesn't. Oh, sorry. Uh, OK, so uh, we model the extra utility uh, resident households derived from holdings uh, liquid asset as a CES bundle of the three liquid assets. So uh, cash, domestic cash, domestic deposit and the foreign CBDC. Then following uh, Agur et al, we assume that uh, holding cash is a, a disutility in terms of security loss because uh, cash can be easily stolen or lost, while deposit yield a cost in terms of loss of anonymity because uh, deposits are fully traceable. So uh, the CBDC can be more similar to cash or to deposit. And so the noting with Psi, the degree of similarity between uh, uh, CBDC and cash, we can write uh, the security loss as the value of cash plus uh, Psi times the value of the CBDC. Well, the anonymity loss can be written as the value of deposit plus one minus Psi times the value of the CBDC. So the banking sector is modeled following Gertrude and Karadi. So, we, so we, each bank invests in corporate loans using domestic deposit, foreign deposits, and its net worth, and uh, uses these, uh, these sources to finance corporate bonds to domestic firms. And of course, these, these loans are equal to capital times its, uh, its value. Theta n can be interpreted as a macroprudential measure because it is a subsidy to banks' net worth. Bankers, as in Gertler and Caradi, can divert a fraction theta of assets, so depositors, in order to trust the banking system, require that the value of the bank should be greater or at least equal to the value of the divertible asset. And this financial friction is important because it induces an equilibrium a spread between the lending rate and the deposit rate. So Gertrude and Karadi show that in equilibrium, banks choose the same leverage, and this leverage is uh, increase, an increasing function of the spread between the lending and the deposit rate. We also assume that uh, uh, the foreign deposit rate depends on three components. The um, foreign interest rate, R star, which is exogenous, a tax on foreign deposit, and an endogenous risk premium, which depends positively on the, overall, on the aggregate level of uh, uh, foreign deposits. The, the idea is that uh, the overall indebtedness vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, the higher the return that banks have to pay to foreign households in order to have uh, deposits from, the, from them. And the solution of, of the bankers' problems gives uh, an uncovered disparity condition between domestic and, and foreign deposits, in which the currency premium depends on the stock of foreign deposit and on the uh, capital flow management measure on inflows, which is the tax on foreign deposits. So we calibrate the model to, to a typical uh, emerging market economies. Uh, time t refers to quarters. Uh, the banking parameters are taken from McKinsey and Keralto, while the other macroeconomic parameters follow the integrated policy framework of the IMF. Uh, the liquidity parameters are taken from Cova et al. and from Burlon et al. So we simulate uh, uh, the transition of the economy to a new steady state characterized by stronger preferences toward the foreign CBDC. And this transition is modeled as an increase in the weight of the foreign CBDC in the liquidity bundle from zero to 10% in 20 periods that correspond to five years. And this transition happens in, in three different, uh, under three different scenarios. A cash-like scenario in which Psi is equal to one and in which uh, 
the increase in the weight of the foreign CBDC is compensated by a decrease of the weight of cash, of domestic cash. And this is the red line in the figure. Then we have a deposit-like scenario in which Psi is equal to zero, and the increase in the weight of the foreign CBDC is matched by a decrease in the weight uh, of deposits in the liquidity bundle. And finally, we have, and this is the blue line. And finally, we have a liquidity expansion shock in which Psi is equal to 1.5, so CBDC is intermediate between cash and deposits, and in which uh, the, the weight of deposit and cash are, are kept constant. So this liquidity expansion shock can be interpreted as a technology shock brought by the, the, the CBDC that increases the liquidity uh, of households without affecting the preferences for cash or deposits. This figure illustrates uh, the transition under uh, the three scenario. So uh, af when the shock, uh, the preference shock uh, affect the, affect start to affect the economy, in the cash-like scenario, the red line, household substitute domestic cash with the foreign CBDC. So this leads uh, to a depreciation of, of, of the domestic currency. Uh, and also to a an higher CPI inflation rate. So the central bank reacts by increasing the policy rate, uh, but also the bond rate is equal to the policy rate. So this, this triggers an increase in the, in, the, in the bond rate. So now households uh, increase the, the investment in bond, in local bonds, and, and reduce their domestic deposits. So the deposit rate uh, uh, goes up. Domestic banks uh, face um, an increase in their uh, financing costs. And moreover, uh, given the, the devaluation of the domestic currency, uh, the value of, of the foreign liability increases in terms of domestic currency. Uh, and so the bank's network go down, and in order to preserve the profitability, banks have to increase the lending rate more than one to one with respect to the deposit rate given our financial friction. And this uh, induces a fall in capital demand and in economic activity. In the deposit-like scenario, which is the blue line, uh, households substitute directly uh, Domestic cash with with uh, sorry domestic deposit with the foreign CBDC, and this leads to a permanent fall in domestic deposits. So uh, domestic banks face even higher financing costs because the deposit rate increases to a greater extent, and this increase is more persistent. So the lending rate should go up and this depresses even more the capital demand and production. The liquidity expansion shock is in between these two cases because uh, uh, domestic households substitute uh, um, the foreign CBDC for both cash and uh, um, deposit. So now we, see, we, we can see which, which are the policy instruments that can um, mitigate the negative effect of the preference shock? So in, we focus uh, on, uh, on, um, on the deposit-like scenario, which is the most interesting, given its uh, macroeconomic consequences. And, and this scenario will be always depicted with a blue line, and we will analyze different policy tools, starting with macroprudential, uh, with a macroprudential tool, uh, so the subsidy uh, to banks' net worth, which is the black line. And this subsidy has a triangular shape because it increases, tracking the increase in the preference toward the foreign CBDC, and then when the preference reaches the new steady state, it decreases. And you can see that this policy tool is, is effective in reducing the negative effect of the preference shock because it limits the fall in banks' net worth. So banks have to increase to a lesser extent the lending rate in order to preserve their profitability. At the same time, also a sale of FX reserve is effective, the, the, the red line, because it, it uh, reduces the depreciation of the domestic currency. 
Similarly, a tax on outflows, which in our framework is a tax on, for, on, on the holdings of the foreign CBDC, is useful to reduce the negative impact of the preference shocks on the banking and the real sector, because this tax on outflows, of course, discourages the household investment in, the, in, in a foreign asset, and so it limits the depreciation of the currency. Conversely, a tax on inflows, which in our framework is a tax on uh, the, um, foreign deposit, is counterproductive because it increases uh, the financing cost for banks. And in fact, in the black line, you see that the net worth, the bank's net worth go down more uh, to, to a greater extent. So, so far, we have seen what happens if the central bank reacts to changes in, uh, in CPI inflation, uh, which is the blue line here. Uh, if uh, the central bank responds to PPI inflation, it needs to, to, to increase the policy rate uh, to a lower extent because PPI, in order to stabilize PPI inflation, because PPI inflation is not directly affected by the depreciation of, of the currency. Uh, on the other hand, if the economy has an exchange rate peg, which is the black line, the central bank has to increase even more the policy rate in order to avoid a nominal depreciation of, of the currency. And this explains why uh, uh, the PPI inflation case, the red line, is better in dealing with the preference shocks than uh, CPI inflation and, and, and a peg economy. And, final, and finally, the last result, we, we, we see now uh, what are the effects of a 1% increase in the foreign interest rate on the economy according to different uh, levels of investment in the, in the foreign CBDC. So you can see that, looking at, at, at the blue line, that an increase in the foreign interest rate has a recessionary effect on the economy if the, if the small open economy has no foreign CBDC holding. The blue line because uh, uh, an increase in the foreign interest rate leads to depreciation then to higher inflation and uh, the central bank has to increase the, the policy rate so higher deposit rate reduction of net or higher lending rate uh, lower capital demand and lower production uh, so while uh, if, the, if, the, if the, the small open economy has a medium or small value of, of, of CBDC holdings close to 2% of the GDP, or even better, if it has a, a, an holding of foreign CBDC close to 10% of GDP, what happens is that after the foreign interest rate shock, household, domestic household, find it convenient to sell the domestic, uh, the, foreign de the foreign CBDC. Why? Because the foreign interest rate has increased also the remuneration on domestic bonds. So domestic household find it convenient to invest in domestic bonds and to sell the foreign CBDC. The sale of the foreign CBDC reduces the depreciation of, of the exchange rate and this limits its negative effect on the banking sector and on the real sector. However, this results holds only if the remuneration of the CBDC remains constant after uh, the increase in the foreign interest rate. In fact, if the remuneration of the CBDC increases, uh, following the foreign interest rate increase, what happens is that domestic households demand more foreign CBDC, not less, and this uh, contributes to, further to, the, to a further depreciation of the exchange rate, amplifying the recessionary effect of the foreign interest rate. It is the green line. So to conclude, we set up a DSG model to study what are the effects of, of a foreign CBDC on a, an emerging market economy? And we have seen that if the CBDC is uh, uh, perceived or is designed to be more similar to deposits, there, is, there, there 
could be a, a banking disintermediation problem in the small open economy, a credit crunch, so a lower production. We have seen that taxing uh, CBDC holdings, selling foreign exchange reserves, and subsidizing banks can help to smooth the, the, um, uh, the transition. Um, and we have also seen that PPI targeting is preferable to uh, CPI targeting or exchange rate pegging in dealing with uh, uh, an higher preference toward this foreign CBDC. And if the remuneration is constant, of, if the remuneration of the CBDC is constant, high stock of this foreign CBDC can help the small open economy to smooth the effect on an increase of an increase of the foreign interest rate. Thank you very much for your attention. Livio, it's going to be the um, Livio Straka from the ECB. Sorry, it will be the um, Livio was my boss, so that's why I said Livio. But but okay, so <laughs> Livio Straka from the ECB uh, is going to be the discussant. Okay, so thanks all for invited to this very nice conference. I was reminded of this conference a few days ago when I was, um, so I, uh, after playing tennis, I wanted a beer. So that I went to the bar, but the bar owner told me that only cash is accepted. Uh, I didn't have any physical cash. And, uh, you know, therefore, before the arrival of digital euro, I had to give up on my beer. So hopefully in a few years time, uh, the beer will be insured. Um, so this is, um, is a very, is a very, um, uh, I would say not only nice paper, but also very uh, mature paper. So it's, it's very, uh, it's full of robustness checks, I, I will say in a moment. So it was a pleasure to discuss uh, this particular paper. How do I go down now with the, like this? Okay. Okay, so uh, in terms of what the paper uh, does, I mean, you have seen uh, it presented by Alessandro very, very effectively. So it's a, essentially a DSG model of a, of a floating small open economy, uh, you know, sold under kind of perfect foresight. So the, the main exercise of the author is to introduce a foreign CBDC. So say you are in a, in a, in a, a small country in Latin America and people start using a, a dollar the dollar uh, CBDC. So whenever, whenever this happens, or, or a digital euro, maybe you no. Know, so, um, and so, so they find that um, you know this, the foreign CBDC, in particular, if it is deposit-like, so more similar to deposits, so without privacy but with more security, uh, crowds out uh, domestic deposits. So the banks um, are model like in and Karadi. Uh, so you, you, you're probably very familiar with, with, with that model, but they add some EME features. So foreign currency deposits. So the, the, this is what they call the original sin. Uh, and, and, and also the interest rates on those deposits is tied to, to the economy's uh, external debt. And they also have, uh, which I don't think was mentioned by Alessandro in the presentation, the um, dominant currency pricing, which is a kind of a very EME feature. And there are two types of, of foreign CBDC, uh, the cash-like and deposit-like, as was explained. So in terms of key results, uh, so because in this model, banks are special for lending. I mean, this is a theme that we have seen in answering other papers. There is a loss of output. So banks cannot perform the, this, this intermediation role as effectively as before. Uh, and plus, there is also uh, a financial accelerator mechanism through uh, currency depreciation. So pre precisely due to these EME features, uh, you know, there, there, is a, there is a depreciation side that also, you know, tightens uh, uh, financing conditions overall. Uh, what is interesting also is the output loss largely disappears if the EME banks can borrow from the central bank. Uh, but there are some short-term costs. Uh, I, I still have not fully understood what drives these short-term costs. So perhaps this is a question for the authors. And then they, they show, but again, this is related to the, to the EME features I was, I was talking about. So the, the, there are some policies that can be uh, implemented to smooth the, the transition. In particular, they find that capital controls on outflows, on outflows are also selling FX reserves uh, and targeting PPI inflation. I mean, PPI inflation has this exchange rate uh, component to it, uh, um, reduces the loss of output along the, the transition. So in terms of the position of the paper in the leisure, this is clearly, um, well, first of all, is a well-executed paper, uh, policy relevant, and it was quite a pleasure to, to read. Uh, and the paper fits very, very much in the leisure on digital dollarization. 
uh, and the closest paper to, to it are uh, Ikeda and, and Popesco. So I think Alessandro was very kind to mention uh, our paper, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's a different issue. So this is about you know, a small open economy importing the CBDC of, of a large economy. Um, and and so the 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 the, the key for uh, for the CBDC is the displacement of domestic deposits, uh, and domestic deposits are are a, a cheap source of financing for banks. So this is the idea of the deposit franchise. So the, the banks uh, have the kind of privilege to issue very uh, low interest rate uh, liabilities uh, because the, the deposits are special. Uh, and so the, the the introduction of this, I mean, similar to other papers in in this uh, conference, uh, you know, the introduction of CBDC threatens that that monopoly or or that trend. Um, yeah. So um, so the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the paper is a rather advanced stage. Uh, so there is not so much, unfortunately, I can say uh, in terms of comment. The authors have already carried out uh, several uh, several robustness exercises. So here I just kind of give you some open questions, uh, which partly are related to the paper itself and partly to the implications of the paper. So, so one first question I have is that you know what what is uh, exactly specific to a foreign CBDC in this paper? I mean, I my hunch is that the same results can be derived from a stablecoin. So, if PayPal issues a stablecoin in dollar in dollars and this is used in say Argentina. You know, is it is it different from what uh, from what you were probably not? Uh, I would see, I even say that it's probably not so different. I mean, not fundamentally different from a domestic CBDC. So, what if the EME? So, if Argentina issues its own CBDC, uh, you know, how how different would that be? I guess oh, the, the the overall effects would be would be quite similar. Uh, second question is how important are the EME um, characteristics? So I think it's a nice feature of the paper, or the model that um, you know the authors really had made an effort to to introduce these EME features. But um, I was also wondering how how important are they? Um, and and I mean one exercise which I, I don't think they do, but they could be done is to simulate the model with and without them. So you can you could have say an advanced economy version of the model. So it's more open advanced, an advanced small open economy, vis-a-vis -vis as EME small open economy, and and, and you know and with these two partition of the model, uh, premise of the model, you can you can kind of derive impulse responses. So it would be interesting to compare, to compare uh, the developed economy or EME uh, version of the, of the models. So one one uh, one point that uh, again can, you know is common to other papers in this conference is that I feel that the demand for foreign CBDC comes a bit of nowhere. So, so we know that so we know the monetary regimes are persistent. Uh, so we know that even bad, even with bad monetary policy and you know bad central banks, which of course is not the case here in Europe, but but in other countries where you have bad central banks, uh, it's, 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 the 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 uh, you know still monetary standard stays so monetary. Um, so it's very it's very hard for it's very hard for consumers to switch uh, monetary units. Uh, uh, so you, you you only do it when when situations are really desperate. So you had to go to Zimbabwe to to really uh, where where now the you know the, the dollar is used as paper toilet to really change the the uh, the monetary unit. And so so it, this EME economy they have in the paper is quite well behaved. You know the, the central bank is inflation targeting. You know it's is well well behaved. So why why on earth should out of the sudden that people want a foreign CBDC? It's not clear. So it's possible that, of course, the foreign CBDC has uh, some some liquidity services. Um, but there, I know I would I would rather associate those liquidity services to something more like like a stable coin. You know, maybe it's used in some social media. Uh, but I mean, a foreign CBDC uh, is not. Um, you know, think also of of uh, of, of you know well behaved uh, small open economies in Europe. So why should they out of a sudden? You know, adopt the digital euro. It's not clear, no. So why, you know, country like Denmark, you know, um, so why should the digital euro? Now, why the, the uh, you know the Denmark dollarize suddenly just when the digital euro is introduced? I, I, I don't think it's so clear. So this is probably is a, a question which goes a bit beyond the model, but I think it's a general question for 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 the conference. I mean, some of these uh, shocks to 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 introducing CBDC are a bit artificial. So what's really happening is not clear. Uh, so what, another question I had reading the paper is what is the effect of the transition on household utility? Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, what, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm reading the paper wrongly, but you know, if, if the, if the households, uh, 
won the foreign CBDC, you know, that's by definition, I guess, must be welfare enhanced. So if you have an output loss, you know, the output loss is a price of that preference. So in a sense, you know, the, the, the household utility is not, is not jeopardized. So, it, uh, so the output loss is, is just one side of this preference shift and, and decided maybe has to, to be accepted. So, so that's a bit the, the question. So it doesn't seem to be a result of an externality. It's just, you know, given the prices and the parameters of the model, you know, this uh, preference shift leads to, to less output. Um, and then, and finally, I mean, the, the, the paper as a part, uh, um, with, I mean, I, I mentioned this, this exercise that, uh, you know, if the banks can borrow from the central bank, uh, you know, then this, this borrow from the central bank, borrowing from the central bank, it restores, you know, the bank intermediation and reduces the output loss or, you know, eliminates the output loss. Um, but I guess the broader question for the whole conference is, you know, when, when we do this shift, so, so banks, rather than borrowing from depositors, they borrow from the central bank. You know, why is this uh, a problem? Why is this the welfare reducing? So one, one cost maybe is, is that you need collateral to borrow from the central bank, but is it a relevant cost? Uh, and it would be nice also to tailor this cost to EME fissure. So is it, uh, I mean, I'm not familiar enough maybe with EME central bank uh, operating procedures, but you know, is, is, is it difficult for EME banks to borrow from the EME central banks? So this is uh, this 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 part could be kind of enriched with some more kind of uh, real world uh, color, but overall, as I mentioned, this is a really uh, nice paper. I encourage everybody um, to read, and uh, I think it is a useful addition to the literature. Thank you. Any questions from the from the floor or um, online, from that matter? Massimo, expectedly. <laughs> No, sorry. Um, uh, I have one question about uh, the um, the banks in this model. No, so one uh, uh, reasonable thing to do uh, for the banks will be to uh, pay more deposits. No, so you, they can they can give up a bit of the profits and uh, remunerate a little more the deposit to prevent uh, the outflow when the CBDC is introduced. It doesn't seem necessarily the case, or at least they don't uh, increase the uh, deposit rate as much as, as necessary to reduce the outflow of funds. Um, I'm wondering, is this, um, let's say, characteristics of, the, of, of how the model is, is solved, or is something that emerged from the dynamic? If I remember correctly, the galtre karadi formalism, you have a um, these parameters that tells you how likely is that that the bankers runs away with the money and interest rates are kind of pinned down by 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 this by this parameter friction which i guess is not changed when cbdc's are, are introduced so it stays there uh, is, is this correct that let's say is a um, characteristic of the model this this latency in the deposit rate or is something that emerged and have not understood correctly um Thank you. Thank you. But it's, it's as Livia said, a very nice paper. Long shadow of David Andolfato is he's in this conference. Okay. Um, another question. Um, yeah, just a, I guess a policy question, which is when you have the foreign CBDC in the uh, kind of liquidity function. <clears throat> to me, that that suggests that household foreign households are able to use uh, sorry domestic households are able to use the foreign CBDC for uh, for purchasing goods in the domestic country, right? So it would be worth thinking about exactly how easy it would be for the, you know, say the ECB uh, to restrict to restrict that. In the middle. Okay. Martin Mantler, Bundesbank. Um, so if I remember correctly, you don't have foreign banks in the model so but i was thinking well wouldn't it be more likely that for example domestic households would hold deposits with foreign banks but that uh, this might be more costly or let's easily doable and then they switch to foreign cbdc or that domestic households could hold foreign currency denominated deposits with their domestic banks and that this would be basically the entryway into or cbc would be a close substitute uh, for this anymore from the room but i have a question from carlos arango from the colombian central bank who is asking how would issuance of the eme help smooth the transition i understand issuance how would issuance of the of a cdbc in emes i suppose help smooth the transition 
yeah, I mean, you can interpret it. As, that's the cost of the hybrid format, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to go. Sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, you okay, okay. Then. I have a very quick question. So, I mean, you put the, uh, of course, here, I, I, you put CBDC into into the liquidity. I just wonder, in general, if, if for example, uh, EME has better access to foreign capital market, for example, it's easier for me to buy, I don't know, uh, the, the bonds or, 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 or stocks in the U.S. or more advanced uh, countries, would that be? Uh, be it different. I just wonder whether the effect the effect is going to be similar to CBDC or or what is so special about CBDC like relative to other 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 investment opportunities. Really? I'm actually impressed how energetic the, the room still is. It's six o'clock, but <laughs> so, excellent. Um, just a very quick thought and shooting from the hip, and I don't know this class of models very well, but it seems. Uh, that at the core of the banking part is kind of a moral hazard friction, like almost something like Holmstrom Tirol, right? So that you need to have, you need to ensure uh, no absconding. And then the CBDC might actually directly affect that friction, right? I mean, if, as Governor Panetta said earlier, there's no access, no access, no access, this is really strong privacy uh, protection, then it might actually allow you to to abscond the funds uh, more easily. So, and my larger point is there might be interaction between CBDC and uh, the friction that is at the core of the model. Anyone? Nope. Okay, we're done. Long list already. Thank you very much for all your questions. Uh, I start from the last one, also because it is the one that I remember. Uh, <laughs> yes, there is, a, uh, there is an agency problem in the banking system. So basically, uh, the, banking, the, the bankers have to increase their profitability in order to, uh, to convince the depositor to trust. And, um, and actually, there is there is already there is not an explicit interaction with the CBC in in that specific uh, uh, in that specific sector, uh, because for 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 bank for banks uh, uh, CBDC is a dominated asset because its uh, remuneration is lower than uh, corporate loans, so they invest in corporate loans. But we can once can think a way to incorporate also uh, a, a, um, an investment in CBDC by banks. Uh, but there is a, uh, an implicit interaction uh, because uh, the higher preference, the, the higher preference toward the foreign CBDC induces a depreciation uh, of the currencies, which makes for banks harder to repay the foreign debt. So it's an interaction through general equilibrium. Exactly, exactly. It's a general equilibrium effect. Um, Then there is the, the issue of bonds. Uh, we, we, we have an extension in which we allow domestic households also to invest directly in foreign bonds, or if you, you can think uh, uh, general uh, asset, foreign assets. Uh, the model results do not change uh, um, if uh, these assets do not enter in the liquidity bundle. Uh, otherwise, uh, but of course, uh, the idea of the liquidity bundle is that uh, um, this is a, a reduced form to capture that these assets are immediately available for payment. So the, uh, the alternative would be to have a cash in advance constraint, but to tract for tractability purposes, we use this, uh, this uh, reduced form approach and, and, and we include that only uh, very liquid assets. Uh, then the, the issue of, of, um, of deposits. It, it's true uh, how you describe the Gertrude Caradi model, but uh, the idea, the idea here, here is that uh, the, the, pref the stronger preference for the foreign CBDC 
uh, reduces directly the supply of savings from domestic bank to, to the to dom from domestic household to domestic banks in the case of the deposit like scenario and indirectly in a cash like scenario because there the causal chain works in, in a different way but uh, but there is a, substantially a drop of, of the supply of saving from domestic household to domestic banks. Then if you don't have Gertler Karadi, uh, so the banking system is just a veal, you have uh, a one-to-one -one increase uh, of the lending rate with respect to the deposit lay, uh, rate. With a financial friction, you have a, a more than one-to-one -one reaction of the lending rate with respect to the deposit rate. So because domestic firm have to convince uh, uh, depositor to trust the systems. Uh, then <laughs> I go to leave your comment. Thank you very much again. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think you are right. Uh, it's not uh, um, so, it's not too clear how to distinguish between a foreign CBDC vis-a-vis -a, -vis a foreign stable con they are pretty similar maybe one can play with the security uh, weight because one can think that a, a foreign cbdc is more secure than a foreign stable coin because this is privately issued versus a, a public uh, uh, form of or mean of payment um it will be interesting to see uh, a, a difference between a, sm a small open economy model for an advanced economy and a small open economy for emerging market economy. Uh, we focus on the emerging market economy because it is easier to justify the presence of a foreign CBDC uh, and, and the absence of a domestic CBDC. And the, the relevant aspect of, of, of our model, more than the dominant currency pricing, which we have introduced just in the last version of our paper, because the referee asked to do that, is the original scene. Uh, this is very. This is the, the this, a feature that can distinguish a, a small open economy model for an emerging market than a small open economy model for an advanced uh, uh, emerging for an advanced economy. Uh, so here is where I expect to to see different dynamics. And in particular, uh, I, my guess is that uh, uh, the problem or the, the macro financial implication on, 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 an economy, on an advanced economy will be smaller given the, uh, that the problem of, of the foreign denomination of debt is, 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 less, uh, is less crucial. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, I do not uh, have the time to show, but we have also an extension of what, uh, um, I, I will conclude, and will conclude, uh, on what uh, can happen if the uh, domestic central bank provide some, uh, some liquidity injection uh, to the domestic banks. And this is a, uh, another policy tool that can Effective, effectively address the negative effect uh, of the shocks in line with uh, Brunner Meyer and Nippel paper, but um, we are not able to find an equivalent result in our framework because there is also this uh, negative externalities linked to the to the external debt denominating foreign currency, because uh, banks uh, basically as it is standard in a small open economy model, issue foreign debt, and they ignore that the effect that they have a negative effect on the other banks because they contribute to increase the overall in debt vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, and this leads to an increase in the rate on the foreign deposits. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>